Home server, tiny as possible, lots of horsepower, not a lot of power usage. It's actually sort of a pain in the butt to find this combination of things. It's frustrating too because this mini forum machine, this is the UM560. And this is like 200-ish US dollars or less. Doesn't come with memory or storage, but you can throw old notebook memory in here and be off to the races. This is dual HDMI and this has got a lot of ports that don't make sense in the context of a NAS. I mean, this is basically a mini desktop computer. You're gonna repurpose that for network storage. There's not even room to put anything in here. It's really frustrating because, you know, a couple hundred bucks is a really good deal. If you buy a four, six, eight bay NAS off of Amazon, you're looking at spending a thousand dollars on that platform. And that's not necessarily a bad deal depending on what you're looking for. But if you know exactly what you're doing with your own software and you want to run a free or open source operating system like TrueNAS or you want to pay 20 bucks for something like Unraid, you don't, you don't really get any benefit from those platforms anyway. We recently took a look at Asus Store, which lets you load your own operating system on it. You can do that with QNAP as well. And if you do that, I think you lose a lot of the advantage that you get from buying those brands of appliances. But it seems like an impossible situation. I just want three or four or five hard drives to store my media on, but I want this much horsepower because this little machine has got more horsepower than any of those NAS computers. You have to get into Xeon D territory, like true enterprise grade hardware, in order to approach the amount of horsepower that's in this little thing. Heck, even this thing supports basic ECC functionality. Hardware error correcting memory is definitely a nice to have, but it is not an absolute deal breaker if you don't have it. So what are you gonna do? This is four three and a half inch bays and I have 60 terabytes of raw storage in there. 80 terabytes, okay, it's 80 terabytes of raw storage, 60 terabytes of usable space. Four drives, one drive of redundancy connected to this with a 10 gigabit interface. Before we get into drives and memory and everything else, mini PC with 10 gigabit USB connected via 10 gigabit USB to a four drive disk enclosure, your total outlay is less than $400. This is your small home server solution. Let's go over the caveats and gotchas. All right, first up, <laughs> there's the NAB6. This is an even better choice than the UM560, but this costs a little more, but it's got dual two and a half gig interfaces, a little bit more horsepower. It's got a two and a half inch drive bay as well as your NVMe slot. So if you think creatively, you've got some options. And that's really what I want you to do is think creatively. Now, if it's an absolute showstopper deal breaker that you must have 10 gigabit ethernet, I would encourage you to check out our, uh, our cheat codes video, our M.2 cheat codes, because you can get a lot of things other than storage devices. This is a ninth gen Intel NUC. These are starting to pop up on eBay because this is expandable and you can add storage here. This thing actually has three M.2 in it, uh, two on the carrier card and one on the PCIe expansion in the bottom. This also has dual Thunderbolt ports, HDMI out, four USB, and two 2.5 gig NICs. So you can put a 10 gig NIC in this and use this in connection with external three and a half inch storage. And this actually uses quite a bit more power, but it's actually still a very small configuration. The base power for something like this is like 3540 watts at idle, plus your drives. This is more on the order of 10 watts at idle. This is six cores, that's eight cores. This is a true Xeon. This is available in a true Xeon configuration with error correcting memory. Uh, this is, you know, the Ryzen platform is, it just so happens to do ECC, whereas this being a true Xeon platform can do deliberate ECC. So it's sort of a, sort of a weird situation. Now for your power usage for drives, it's basically fixed. And because it's a fixed part of the equation, uh, you don't really have to worry about it. So if you're really worried about power, you wanna run on as few drives as possible. Three drives is a sweet spot of uh, cost versus capacity. Three drives is two drives worth of capacity and any one drive can fail, and that's probably okay up to 20 terabyte hard drives. This new thing called dual actuator hard drives has entered the scene. Dual actuator hard drives are twice as fast. Unless you're using dual actuator hard drives, 
normal hard drives will not saturate this interface, or it'll come close. There's a bunch of versions of this case, but this model is the one that is 10 gigabit type C. I've tested a bunch of these. This one is the least bad for 10 gigabit and power usage and everything else, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But overall, it's basically fixed costs for drives. If you're not familiar with creating your own home NAS or your home network appliance, this is your first foray. There is nothing wrong with buying a device from Synology or Asus Store or QNAP or one of those companies. The software package is a lot of what you're paying for. There's a lot of cool, neat stuff in the software that those uh, NAS companies provide and that's the value add. That's what you're paying for. That and the enclosure and everything else. With this DIY solution, it's going to be a little bit more janky, but it's going to cost a lot less for the platform before you add drives and memory and everything else. So this is also kind of the paradox. If you just want an appliance that you set and forget it, you don't need to do this and you probably shouldn't do this. But if you're looking to add a lot of extra functionality to your home network, maybe you want to set up more than one of these in a redundant cluster. Maybe you want to set up more than one of these in a redundant cluster with Thunderbolt. That's an advanced topic. We've covered that as well. But that is an option that you can do. Pi hole for whole network add filtering, which is something you can do on basically anything. It doesn't really take a lot of CPU horsepower to do that. Plus home assistant for home automation. It can tie into your smart switches in a way that doesn't require the cloud and it's very forward compatible and very awesome to be able to run that kind of home automation stuff. Plex media server, uh, uh, surveillance cameras, if you want to set up real time streaming and like face analysis and that kind of thing. You can DIY some stuff there. Again, some of the paid for solutions are a little bit better. You can do this without the cloud. Wise recently had their security breach. It's like, oh, the Wise cameras. Those cameras are dirt cheap. They are shockingly cheap. I don't know how they're doing it, that it's, you know, $25, $30. Those are as good as like the entry level commercial grade surveillance cameras that are on the order of like $100. But you can use really nice surveillance cameras that cost $150, $200 that give you crystal clear 4K 30 FPS video that you can just zoom in for days or optical zoom and you can tie that back into a solution like this without paying thousands of dollars for a network recording appliance or, or anything like that. But this solution with its 9-ish watts of idle power and up to 75 watts and in, the, in the case of the UM560 worst case scenario this thing is pegged it's only like 60-70 watts whereas something like this is more on the order of 200 watts 250 watts which again, it's not a lot for power for, you know, it's only using 200 watts when you're actually using it. And then it's idling at like 45 watts, 50 watts. That's not terrible. The amount of energy that you spend for idling hard drives versus sleep hard drives is gonna outrun that anyway. Like that at 200 watts, only at 200 watts when you're using it. Your hard drives are gonna be more of a power concern than anything else. But this is an important difference to understand with power usage because in the past, in, on this channel, one of the things we recommended was getting cast off enterprise gear. Get an old server, hook up the server and you're good to go. The problem now is that old servers today use a lot more power than old servers that were five years old five years ago, which means that an old server that was five years old five years ago that is now today 10 years old would use 200 watts, 250 watts when it was idle. A modern server that is three years old or five years old that businesses are getting rid of is probably idling at more like 500 watts. 600 watts, 900 watts. Now there's another really cool thing about this, and that is this enclosure could be a 10 year solution. Yeah, I'm probably gonna feel like six cores and 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory is just too slow in two or three or four years. But four mechanical hard drives in an enclosure like this, when we've moved on to 40 terabyte, three and a half inch mechanical hard drives, you can keep using this enclosure. Yeah, the USB interface is 10 gigabit and we'll probably be on 80 gigabit or 100 gigabit USB by then. Maybe some kind of an optical connection. But USB is likely to be around a lot longer than any other connection just because of the amount of inertia in USB and USB type C. So you think about it in these terms and something like this can work really well. The most important thing is data preservation. And so don't put all your eggs in one basket. This thing should still back up offsite. It should still back up to a cloud service. It should still back up to, you know, something. But this could also serve your media for you remotely. Like you can have a secure connection back to your home network, back to this, and not pay for cloud storage 
for online cloud storage for 20 terabytes of media, just the backups. Or you know, you and a friend can each have your offsite backup appliance somewhere else that does this. There's also people on our forum that are taking their old solutions like this and deploying a so solution like this as their backup. They've got the enthusiast 45 drives, 15 mechanical hard drives, you know, fire breathing media machine at their home. But for the backup system that's offsite, that's replicating only the most important stuff, it's this solution. And this solution will give you 60 terabytes right now today offsite. And yeah, the hard drives are going to cost, you know, a little less than $300 each. So you're looking at over $1,000 of storage, but you can pack in 60 terabytes of storage on this with redundancy, 80 terabytes if you're willing to run without redundancy for your offsite backup, which is, you know, when, when you have a failure, failures tend to cascade, definitely wouldn't recommend that. You, four drives, three drives of data, one drive of redundancy, or you lose one drive's worth of capacity to the redundancy. RAID Z1 if you're gonna run ZFS. Um, it's the configuration that I would run. So I just wanna share this to get you thinking creatively about how you can assemble this stuff. Oh, the other thing is that uh, for reliability and, and longevity, uh, three year ago me, I would have thrown down a flight of stairs for suggesting USB for storage because USB wasn't remotely reliable enough. But I've actually been running this setup for a couple of months now and I've done terrible, terrible things to it and it was shockingly reliable. This is partly because the architecture of USB has changed. So I actually don't recommend doing this on a computer that's old. Like if you've got a first generation, you know, Z370 uh, motherboard, the 10 gigabit USB ports on that are probably trash. Don't use that, please, for the love of all that is holy. You're, you're gonna make your life and mine a headache. Don't do it. Uh, the other thing is the USB enclosures. A lot of the time, these USB enclosures have absolute garbage chipsets. It has only been in the last couple of months that we're finally starting to see 10 gigabit USB chipsets that aren't complete garbage. And this one is not perfect. This, this Pro Box media store thing, there's a lot of room to improve. I really wanna get a bunch more of these storage devices in and find one that's better. This is the bottom rung for what is most acceptable. And actually, there are other models, like they have a five, a five gigabit model and one that does hardware RAID, like where it's RAID inside the box. I don't recommend any of those. Those have a lot of architectural problems. I mean, they kinda do what they say on the box, but I really strongly would not recommend them for this five, 10 years of longevity uh, reliability aspect. One, the five gigabit enclosure with four drives is an older chipset, it's not as reliable. This 10 gigabit chipset uh, tends to recover from errors. There is a bug in the recovering from error thing though, and that is if the power flickers or you wiggle the power connector over here to just, I just wanted to see what would happen, the USB controller in this enclosure will go into an impossible error recovery state and that will cause the USB stack on the host machine to um, never recover. And it never recovers because it's trying uh, the USB connection over and over and over again. So it's just in a loop of retry. And the loop of retry is never gonna work because the USB inside the enclosure um, stopped responding. And so when that happens, you can reboot everything and it'll recover. When you're running ZFS, ZFS will recover from this situation very, very well. So ZFS doesn't trust the hardware to be good, and in this case, ZFS saves the day. If the USB enclosure and the mini PC lose power completely at the same time, and then everything comes back up, you will be 100% completely okay. It will recover from that situation no problem. It's just when the power blinks out for a second, if this manages to stay on, your computer basically manages to stay on, but the enclosure kind of stays on but kind of doesn't, the enclosure can get into an impossible situation where it's telling the host that it's there and it's trying, but it's not actually trying, it's just, it's just crashed. The enclosure exposes four disks to the host operating system. That works on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, whatever you wanna do. You plug in one USB device, you can see four SATA devices, it works great. So no complaints there. The physical architecture of this thing also is there's four screws to remove the fan. So when the fan eventually dies, it's gonna be very easy to replace the fan because the fan at the rear is a completely standard, you know, 80 millimeter, whatever fan. I'm not 100% sure that it's 80 millimeter, but it's a standard fan thing. You don't have to disassemble it. Maintenance is really easy. The physical construction really is not awesome. One of the things that, uh, you look for in an enclosure like this is do they have any vibration dampeners for the mechanical hard drives there's one very thin strip of rubber 
at the uh, front that holds the drives that does the vibration dampening. Disappointing, but this is, again, the most minimum bottom rung enclosure for this kind of thing that will work. I hope I get my hands on some better ones. I'm gonna review them. We're gonna look at that. Uh, if you wanted to run more than one of these, four drives won't do it for you. Eight will do it. You could run two of these. You know, a lot, not all, but a lot of these mini form PCs have two 10 gigabit type C ports and you could use one for one and one for the other and create one big Z pool. That's completely fine. You're just gonna have to move those together. If we ever have a 10 gigabit type C to 10 gigabit ethernet, which will, in reality will probably only be like eight or seven and a half gigabit for the network connection, then you could plug a, an ethernet connection in and have greater than two and a half gig ethernet. But for whatever reason, we don't have a type C to 10 gigabit adapter that's reasonable in 2023 because apparently we're living in caveman times. But we do have a reasonable 10 gigabit type C for hard drive enclosure, 10 gigabit type C. I'm Wendell, if you wanna discuss further, uh, level one forums, I'm hanging out there. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.